is Owen Egan, and I am the West Hartford Probate Court Judge. We're here today on the first installment of a series of programs entitled The Probate Court and You. This program is designed to teach a little bit about what the probate court does and about some of the issues that are presented in the probate court. So thank you for tuning in. We, we hope by the end of this program that we are able to, to teach the public a, what the probate court does, and B, today, about conservatorships and powers of attorney. With me here tonight are two distinguished attorneys. Both are 30 years, have 30 years legal experience. Both are experts in probate law. Both uh, have uh, been recognized by judges and their colleagues alike as having a distinguished career, and they are, they are well received. Attorney uh, Kathleen Berry, who is seated here to my left, has practiced law in West Hartford Center for a number of years. And attorney Charles Shimkus, also seated to my left, has practiced law in Hartford near Trinity College uh, for many years. Welcome, attorney Barry. Welcome, attorney Shimkus. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Judge Egan. Appreciate your being here. Before we start, I want to thank Jen Evans and the hardworking folks here at Channel 5 they have made this possible. They do an amazing job, and I, I really want to thank them for all their help with this program. So let's get to it. First, what is the probate court? The probate court is a trial court as well as a family court. It is sometimes referred to as the people's court. The probate court handles a wide range of sensitive matters affecting children, the elderly, persons with intellectual disabilities, and individuals with psychiatric disabilities, as well as overseeing trusts and estates. The probate court judge handles a docket similar to with, with the, these similar um, items, adoptions, conservatorships, guardianships, name changes, termination of parental rights, commitments for persons with psychiatric disabilities, and powers of attorney accountings, as well as uh, fiduciary accountings. Tonight we will talk about, as I said, powers of attorney and guardianships. And the list goes on. Probate judges in the, in, in the state of Connecticut handle other matters as well. There are 54 individual probate courts in the state of Connecticut. Each of the judges are elected. These are the only judges in the state of Connecticut that are elected. Originally, there were only four courts 300 years ago in the state of Connecticut. Those courts existed in Hartford, New Haven, New London, and Fairfield. During the colonial period, most of the judges handled matters of people who were vulnerable and who needed care and protection, as well as to transfer property at death. As you can see, the probate court has graduated and the legislature has provided many more duties to the probate courts and the probate court judges. Our West Hartford probate court is located on this, the third floor of the, of the uh, town hall. Our, our court sessions are conducted in the town council chambers. The probate court clerk's office is right across the way. The hours of operation for the, for the court are from 8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Please stop in and visit the probate court. We have a wonderful staff. They are kind, compassionate, and they are willing to help anyone who walks through the door with a probate matter. There are many materials available to people uh, and for, for their uh, perusal. Please stop in and, and uh, pick, pick some materials up that might help. Um, we are here to learn today, we are here today to learn about powers of attorney and conservatorships. Powers of attorney. What is a power of attorney? Uh, attorney Barry and Attorney Shimkus, can you please tell the audience how you would define a power of attorney? Power of attorney under the statute, which is the Connecticut Uniform Powers of Attorney Act, is defined as a writing or other record that grants authority to an agent to act in the place of the principal, whether or not the term power of attorney is actually used in the document. So it's a principal, the party given the power of attorney, giving authority to an agent, the person receiving the power of attorney, and it gives them certain powers to act on behalf of the principal. Excellent. What is an attorney in fact? Well, attorney in fact is actually the agent. 
Um, you know, many times they think, well, you have to be a licensed attorney to be attorney in fact. Well, no, the attorney in fact is actually the agent under the power of attorney. So when a document is signed on behalf of a principal, the agent is actually signing as attorney in fact for that principal. There are different forms of powers of attorney, and there's been recent legislation concerning powers of attorney. Can you talk about those, please? Sure. The Uniform uh, Powers of Attorney Act was enacted in October 1st, 2016. It was actually going to be enacted in July, but it was delayed till October. And in the statute, they define two types of powers of attorney. There's a long-form power of attorney and a short-form power of attorney. And just like their name indicates, a short-form power of attorney grants certain powers to the agent that are enumerated in the document. The long-form power of attorney actually expands those powers and adds additional powers uh, that the agent has uh, pursuant to the power of attorney. They're known as the hot powers, which is kind of an interesting term. Um, and actually the documents are executed in a different way, whether it's a short-term power of attorney or a long-term power of attorney. So the statute goes ahead and uh, provides uniform instruments for a short-form and a long-form power of attorney. But we as attorneys are not bound to use only those powers. We can expand on those powers and add them to a power of attorney, which many of us in our practice do. How do you use powers of attorney in your practice? Well, for my clients particularly, we, we think a power of attorney is an invaluable tool for estate planning and just frankly for management of someone's personal affairs or for their financial affairs. A power of attorney allows an agent to go ahead and act on behalf of the particular party, the principal, in a number of different transactions, whether they be financial or personal. And so we as a, a firm, we typically advise people as part of their estate planning to go ahead and execute a power of attorney, to execute a document that allows someone else to act on their behalf. A lot of times we'll see it in a husband and wife situation that they'll go ahead and name the wife or the husband as the attorney in fact or the, uh, the agent. Uh, we also have circumstances where someone who may be elderly will ask one of their children to be uh, their agent uh, to go ahead and transact business or handle their personal affairs on their behalf through a power of attorney. And what's nice about a power of attorney is you can sign the document and the document will survive your incompetence. It's a durable power of attorney. Under the new statute, the term durable does not even need to be uh, included on the power of attorney. It is automatically durable under the Uniform uh, Powers of Attorney Act and will survive the incompetence of the principal. And that's particularly valuable, I think, um, because that's one of the reasons why you do have a power of attorney. There may be a time in your life where you no longer can handle your personal affairs or your financial affairs, and a power of attorney will allow that agent to go ahead and handle those matters for you. So uh, we feel it's invaluable, uh, and frankly, it's probably the least expensive alternative by way of allowing someone else to act on your behalf. And I know we're going to touch on conservatorships shortly, but certainly a power of attorney uh, can go ahead and grant the powers and allow an agent to do certain things for you that um, will be valuable, certainly as time marches on for you. And that power of attorney will remain effective until you die or until you revoke it or until a court decides it's no longer valid. You indicated uh, giving a power of attorney either to a parent or to a child. Could you give a power of attorney to both? You could, and in fact, you can actually set up a power of attorney to multiple people. And within the power of attorney, you would then specify whether it's a several power or whether it's a joint power. And a several power means either one of the parties, any of those parties can act individually on your behalf. If it's a joint power of attorney and it says jointly, then all parties would have to agree to go ahead and transact any business or handle any affair uh, using the power of attorney. So we have a joint power of attorney. We also have a several power of attorney and it's got to be defined within the body of the um, power of attorney. So like <clears throat> Uh, a several would be you might uh, name your spouse and then if your spouse was unavailable or uh, no longer able to then it might be like an adult child. Is that how you would do it? You Absolutely. In order? Absolutely. And, and the several allows either one of those parties to act. Now we've had situations where a client will say, gee, I would just like to make sure that my husband and my oldest daughter uh, act jointly. And so on that basis we would do a joint power of attorney and they both would have to agree in order to use the power uh, pursuant to the power of attorney. Okay. What powers does the person who gives the, the power of attorney retain? They retain all of their rights. The power of attorney does not 
strip you from having the ability to transact your normal business affairs, to handle your personal affairs. It just gives someone else the ability to do that. And the nice part about a power of attorney is if you decide I don't want that power given to that agent any longer uh, or I, I just don't need it any longer, you can revoke it very easily by obviously retaining or taking back the power of attorney or signing a revocation or even having a court determine that the power of attorney is no longer valid. What does it mean when they say I have a durable power of attorney? Durable power of attorney survives the incompetence of the principal. So if there comes a time when you no longer are able to effectively understand uh, business decisions, no longer able to uh, comprehend uh, certain issues and uh, things that you have to deal with as a normal person in the uh, term of your life, that power of attorney that's durable will survive that and it will remain in place until you die. And so, it, therefore, it has that feature for especially elderly people as time marches on and they're no longer able to fully comprehend maybe some of the business transactions that they might be involved in or uh, comprehend some of the personal affairs that they might be involved in. That durable par power of attorney will survive that and allow the agent to act on their behalf. And you want the agent to continue to act on, their, on your behalf because at that point, you're not competent to handle your affairs. Sure, and I think that's one of the main reasons why people do uh, will go ahead and execute a power of attorney. Um, you know, we have clients that execute a power of attorney even when they're a younger person because they may not be available. They may travel a lot. They may not be available to handle some affairs, and they want a spouse or a, one of their children to go ahead and act on their behalf. But you know, really, what the main reason is that we find is people, as they grow elderly, they want to have someone be able to help them with their affairs, and the power of attorney does that, and it certainly survives their incompetence as time marches on. And the important thing, I, I think you'd agree with me, is that they make the selection. They determine who they want to handle their affairs while they're competent and while they can, can make those decisions. Absolutely. And, and again, they maintain the right to go ahead and revoke it at any time. And as I mentioned earlier, we've had uh, situations where somebody has executed a power of attorney. They felt comfortable at that time executing the power of attorney. But at the end of the day, things changed in their life or their relationship with that party changed and they revoked a power of attorney. That's just as easy to do as it is to go ahead and execute a power of attorney. Very good. Yes, for, for example, a lot of uh, couples who have young children do one early on when they're going to go travel maybe for the first time and leave their kids behind and, and uh, they leave a lot of authority or the power of attorney to someone they're related to and then years later as they're aging, uh, then they sort of shift uh, shift the folks for whom they want to be acting on their behalf. That's right. That's, right. That's yeah. right. And it's interesting, too, because under the Uniform uh, Powers of Attorney Act, y if you have execute a subsequent power of attorney, the first power of attorney that you execute is still valid unless you specifically revoke it within the body of the new power of attorney or, as we discussed earlier, you go ahead and revoke it through a, a sep separate writing or you take back the power of attorney or you inform the agent that they're no longer your attorney in fact or your agent for purposes of power of attorney. So it's, in it's, it's important that if you do execute multiple powers of attorney that you keep in mind if you want in fact to have multiple people have those powers or if the new power of attorney is uh, effectively going to be the power of attorney you want to have in place and you want to revoke the other powers of attorney, you need to make an affirmative step in order to do that. It's also wise if the power of attorney has been sent to a bank or some other institution that the person revoking the power of attorney send a notice to that institution that this power of attorney has been revoked. Absolutely. What we typically do in our office is we'll send a transmittal letter along with a copy of the a revocation and that revocation is then delivered to the lender, the bank, um, and so they have adequate notice that the power of attorney that you executed previously is no longer valid. It makes a, you know, it's, it's a very important that you notify any parties that you have, that you're at least aware of, that know of this power of attorney and may act using this power of attorney, that they understand that if there was a revocation, that in fact that's been put in place. So notifying a bank is a perfect example of that. Let's talk about um something that we probably don't want to think about. The power of attorney has done something uh, with the, um, let's say I created the power of attorney and the, power of, the person I've given the power of attorney has done something with my assets and he's used them or she's used them for her benefit or their benefit without my consent. What can I do? 
Well, that's always a concern, and we actually, many of our clients talk about that. Well, if I give this power of attorney, am I effectively, you know, relinquishing all my rights? And we talked about earlier, no, you're not. But they're also concerned about if the agent does not act in their best interests. And certainly as the principal for the power of attorney, if you want to receive a power of attorney accounting of what your agent has done on your behalf, you can petition the probate court and the probate court is obligated to go ahead and order if the principal asks for it, uh, a POA accounting, a power of attorney accounting. And that would mean that they, that agent would have to account for all the monies that they have spent and all the actions that they have taken on your behalf as the agent. And that would then be submitted to the probate court for the probate court's review, as well as obviously the principal's review. And the court can, can make a ruling asking that that money be returned and the court can award attorney's fees and costs to the, to the person who has had money taken from them. Absolutely, and that's what the, the statute now allows for po powers of attorney accounting, the cost of it, the attorney's fees, as you mentioned, Judge Egan, to go ahead and be re received back from the agent if, in fact, it turns out that they did not act in the best interest of the principal. We don't like to think about those things, but it's good that someone can, can watch over the power of attorney. Well, that's right, and that's why if you're an agent for a, a principal, if you've been named as the power of attorney, it is very important to keep good records. Um, you may be asked to go ahead and substantiate why you spent money on behalf of the, the principal. You may be asked to account for where the money went. And so if you're an agent uh, and you received a power of attorney, it is very important that you maintain meticulous records with respect to what you've done for the principal and specifically what you've done from a financial standpoint uh, and what you've paid and what you've gone ahead and uh, reviewed for billings and so forth. Uh, we tell agents, be very careful, keep good records, and if in fact you have to produce them, you'll have them available that you can show to the probate court and to the principal. That's good advice. That's very good advice. The next question I have, I think, is probably more for Kathleen. What happens uh, if a conservator is appointed? What happens to the power of attorney? Um, <clears throat> well, um, the probate judge can actually keep parts of the power of attorney in place uh, and remove uh, other aspects of the responsibilities of the power of attorney. Okay. The probate could, uh, judge could also terminate the power of attorney Absolutely. or suspend the power of attorney and all the powers would be suspended until the conservatorship is lifted, if it is ever lifted. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the uh, audience at home what, what is a conservator? Um, so a conservator Please. is uh, somebody who takes responsibility for the conserved person. A conservator can be a conservator of person or a conservator of estate. So a conservator of person would then be responsible for making a lot of the uh, personal decisions for the conserved person. And a conservator of estate would be responsible for making the financial decisions for the conserved person. Can, can both of you answer the question, what is the difference between a conservator and a power of attorney? Well, a conservator is somebody who is, um, who is ordered by the probate judge, who is given the responsibilities for the pro from the probate judge. It might be somebody who was nominated in the power of attorney, but the conservator operates under the uh, jurisdiction of the probate court. Is that about? That's absolutely right. Okay. On the power of attorney, um, you can nominate a potential conservator down the road as part of the power of attorney. Um, certainly the power of attorney does not require any court interventions, whereas the conservator, as Kathleen has mentioned, uh, is now appointed by the probate court and frankly monitored by the probate court in, in terms of accounting and the actions that that conservator takes. And, and you both would agree that the probate court could appoint a conservator of the person or could appoint a conservator of the estate, or could appoint both. Yes, and it, if the court appoints both, it doesn't have to be the same person. You can nominate, appoint somebody for as conservator person and a different person as conservator of estate. And we actually yeah. see that a lot because there are people that may be attorneys that may be appointed that maybe have a particular expertise from the financial sector, but maybe not so much with respect to the personal affairs of the conserved person. Um, and um, so it, it is actually fairly common to see a conservator of the person be a different person than a conservator of the estate. And even within families, if uh, you're appointing relatives, somebody, one family member is more involved with the day-to-day -day life of, say, the parent, and another, uh, say, sibling or child is going to handle the financial aspects of, of a parent's life. 
Right. Somebody who has, has better expertise in handling finances might be more equipped to do that than yes. somebody else who's handling uh, mom or dad's personal affairs. When a conservator is put in place, the conservator um, generally uh, it takes authority over all, all the affairs and uh, the power of attorney is, is generally suspended or terminated. Uh, the power of attorney sets up an agency relationship between the person granting the power of attorney and um, the person who receives the power of attorney. Uh, it, the conservatorship is, is a uh, court-ordered or a court-appointed individual who will handle the affairs of the person and they will account to the probate court. Yes. Great. Um, can you tell me when someone might seek to have a conservator appointed? Well, generally uh, what happens is um, somebody will file a petition uh, for the appointment of a conservator of person um, when, uh, when the respondent who then would become the conserved person is not able to manage their day-to-day -day life. Even with some assistance, they just can't take on the responsibility and, and keep themselves safe. Um, a conservator of a state gets ap appointed when um, the conserved person cannot manage their financial affairs. Um, a lot of times assets are, are being wasted. Often it happens when, um, say, an elderly person is getting taken advantage of by someone in the community. It could be uh, a solicitor or they're giving away money to friends. There's different circumstances. And so the person themselves can file a voluntary petition to appoint a conservator. That's right. And, and when a person does that, they recognize that they have certain needs and they're asking the court to appoint someone to help them. And it may be somebody that they've designated or it may be somebody that they want the court to designate. Yes, a lot of times I see that more often uh, with a voluntary conservator of a state. Sometimes somebody's just not able to manage their finances. Uh, they're either getting evicted often or they're just not able to keep up with their financial dealings. As uh, Chuck had said earlier, sometimes that's when if they had had a power of attorney in place, they may have relied on the power of attorney. But so sometimes they'll come into the court then and they'll say, um, you know, I'm capable, I understand the decision that I'm making, but I'm giving over this sort of power or authority over this aspect of my life. But by asking for a conservator, um, they're putting the conservator under the jurisdiction and the monitoring of the probate court. So in some ways they're protected by the steps that the conservator is going to take on their behalf. Uh, in, when an involuntary petition, uh, when a petition for an involuntary conservatorship is filed, can you tell the audience at home what happens? <clears throat> yes, so a petition gets filed. Um, it could, it's often filed by a, a relative. It could be a spouse, an adult child, uh, the uh, parent of an adult uh, child, siblings. In any event, a petition gets filed and basically um, what the petitioner is saying is that this person, this respondent, is not capable of managing his or her affairs, and we would like the court to appoint a conservator for this person. Let's just say a conservator of a state and a conservator of person. And so then um, the court gets the papers, and then within 30 days the court has a hearing, and, um, and it goes forward from there. And as part of that hearing, um, the, the court is going to need to have a finding in an involuntary uh, conservatorship that the person is not competent, is incompetent, and that can be done through obviously medical reports, whether it's their, their particular uh, physician that they see on a regular basis or whether in fact the court orders or the petitioner obtains uh, medical records from someone that has examined the uh, conserve, potentially conserved person uh, in order to have that finding that they're incompetent, which is much different than in the case of a voluntary where there is no finding of incompetence. It is a voluntary, the party is volunteering to, have, to be conserved and uh, there doesn't need to be a finding of incompetence. That's correct. It's, a, it's actually a due process hearing where someone's rights are going to be taken away from them if the court decides that they need a conservator appointed. So there's, uh, it's an evidentiary hearing, rules of evidence apply. Clear and convincing is the standard. It's, a, it's by about 75%, the judge m must make the decision that this person, through, the, through medical evidence and testimony and other records, is incompetent and cannot handle either their personal affairs or their financial affairs. Um, the, court, the court then can, <coughs> and, and only then, can, uh, can have a, a conservator appointed and at that point, the court looks 
at the least restrictive means. They, the court wants to let everyone maintain the dignity and control of their affairs to the extent that they can. And the reason that the, the court is appointing a conservator is only to protect that person. And there's a, there's a review of the, the person who is going to be appointed. Uh, what happens if the uh, person has already designated a conservator in advance? Well, um, I, that conservator is somebody that the court should consider and appoint unless there's strong evidence uh, indicating that that person is not qualified or is not uh, no longer wanted by the conserved person. And that dovetails back with, as we talked about earlier, with the power of attorney allowing to have a designation of a conservator. There's also an advanced directive that you can, a separate writing in which you can state that if there is ever a time when a conservator needs to be named, that you would want this particular person to be named as the conservator. And again, the court uh, will give strong weight uh, to that uh, requested designation, but it's not absolute. Uh, obviously, the court will at that time take a look and see if that particular person is an appropriate person to act as the conservator and uh, presumably fulfill the wishes of the, um, the respondent, but it's not absolute. The court still has the discretion to name somebody else. That's correct. Great deference is given to the, to the person's uh, uh, designated appointee. However, we need to examine all of the facts as they, as they occur at the time of the application. Maybe the person that's designated doesn't have the capacity to handle the affairs, um, and it might need, we might need to appoint someone else, but great deference is given to, to the uh, person who has been designated. Um, the Can I just add one sure. thing that we uh, moved over pretty quickly, but uh, when you did mention it's a due process hearing, I wanted to uh, let people know that the attorney, the respondent always has an attorney present, and if the respondent is not able to hire an attorney, the court will appoint an attorney for that person. Good, good so point. I just want to say the person is represented by counsel during this procedure. They, they must be represented yes. by counsel. That's a very good point. Thank you, Attorney Barry. Um, could, we talk, could we talk just briefly about uh, bonds? What is a bond? So <clears throat> a probate bond would be um, required of a conservator of a state who gets appointed to represent somebody who has assets of over $20,000 um, and I think liquid assets of, of 10000 or more. But the whole idea is to protect, to provide some protection for the conserved person um, from the actions of the conservator. Okay. Well, I can see that we're, we're limited on time. so. I'm going to conclude at this point. I'm going to thank Attorney Barry and thank Attorney Shimkus for spending time with me uh, today. I appreciate all your information and your knowledge, and thank you for, for being here. Uh, both of these are very important topics, and they should be discussed with your legal counsel. Uh, powers of attorney and conservatorships are, are extremely important, and they should be a part of any estate plan. I hope this has helped uh, the audience understand a little bit about the probate court and a little bit about powers of attorney and conservatorships. This is Owen Egan, the West Hartford Probate Court judge, uh, saying goodbye. Thank you very much. I'll sign off.